Check, check, check. Hey, Shalom, Israel, Most High, and Christ bless all. Captain Zakar here. Good to go. All right. So uh, let's get into it here. Uh, we're going to go through Genesis chapter 9 through 12 today. Welcome to YC 365, four chapters a day. Okay. Uh, we are going to read through it, and I'll precept as I go. Um, and uh, things that I can explain, I'll explain. Um, some stuff is just, it, it, it'll take us off into another class. So I can explain it. I'll drop a little bit on it and we'll move. If you got more questions pertaining to what we go over today, just um, write us a message on IUIC Classroom, and we'll be sure to get to it uh, throughout the week because we just don't have enough time for everything, especially chapters of Genesis 9 through 12. You can precept each chapter for hours itself to come to the next one. All right, so uh, let's get started here. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Right? Replenish the earth. Why? Because we know what just happened. But replenish it how? Uh, let's go to Sirach 16. Rock chapter 16, and let's read one through three. Replenish it, replenish it. What? Um, if I can, while we're doing this, have a brother scribe um, the scriptures as we go along. And sisters, please stop typing away and pay attention. Do not need you rambling on Facebook because you're not in a, a school. Just listen. Right, and a bro I need a brother to scribe for me. Okay, here we go. Uh, Sirach sixteen and one. It says, "Desire not a multitude of unprofitable children, neither delight in the ungodly sons." We went here to explain what uh, replenish. Okay. Uh, they said my mic is a little little low, so make sure you turn me up. Turn me up. Okay. All right, so like I said, we went here to do what? To explain uh, replenish, okay? We're here to explain replenish. Replenish what? Uh, desire not a multitude of unprofitable children, neither delight in ungodly sons. Though they multiply, rejoice not in them, except the fear of the Lord be with them. Trust not thou in their life, neither respect their multitude, for one that is just is better than a thousand, and better it is to die without children than to have them that are ungodly. Um, somebody says we can't hear. Okay, let's try this again. Type Y if you can. Type Y if you can. Move on. All right, we good. Let's keep moving on. So we went to Exodus 6, I mean, Sirach 16, 1 through 3, uh, to explain the replenishing. Replenish the earth with righteous people, right? All right. Um, now, back in Genesis, Genesis chapter 9, verse 2. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every bread, uh, every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hands are they delivered. So this is how it was supposed to be from the jump, right? Um, I want to go to the precept of uh, Isaiah just to show, you know, we things have digressed uh, from this, you see remnants of it of 
nerds and animals wasn't how it was in the beginning. Uh, let's show you this. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. This is originally how it's supposed to be with the relationship we have with animals and humans. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, and let's read verse 6 on down. It says, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Not happen. Know that. No. Lamb is the wolf meat. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Right, which is, okay. um, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. This is the relationship that is how it's supposed to be. Animal. Because a lion would devour a kid, a leopard would devour a kid, and a calf, he couldn't lead upon calf. He couldn't pull him. Uh, verse 7, and the cow and the bear shall feed their young ones, and their young, uh, their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the winged child shall put his hand on the cockatrice which is a snake. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The knowledge of the Lord, the whole earth, those animals will be filled with the knowledge of their, uh, what you would say, their original state, which is like we read back in Genesis chapter 9, verse 2. Let's go back to it. They'll have the knowledge of their original state when things are set back in order, just like it used to be. Uh, it says, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. That's what we read in Isaiah 11, where you able to lay down with them. Animals coexist with each other. You won't be afraid of them. Not even a kid will be afraid of them. Um, and it says, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Three. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So now we read about what? This is the introduction of man eating meat. It is the introduction of man now being able to eat meat. And no, the Lord didn't change the uh, give us a new stomach and implant another one. It, it was already there. You know how stuff just lay dormant in your body until it's ready to be used. That's what we experienced here after the flood, right? Uh, but what does that, what does God say about us being able to eat those meats, right? That are round about us and get another priest. Uh, let's go to it. Uh, you know what I want in Sirach? If you're talking to myself, you know what I want. <laughs> Uh, where are we at? Sirach 30, right? 30. Let's see. Three, I think. I'm looking for the meats, right? Oh, yeah. All right. Here we go. Uh, Sirach chapter 37. And let's read 27 on down. We're dealing with the meat part. Now we're able to eat meat after the flood. What does that mean for us still this day? Uh, Sirach 37, 27. My son, prove thy soul in thy life and see what is evil for it. And give not that unto it. Mean. Everything ain't always good. Some people, um, you know, you can eat chips, and chips, and things like that, and your blood pressure still stay. Some of us will eat um, chips and dips and all of that type stuff, and you got a headache. You got to go to the doctor. Now you're on blood pressure <laughs> medication. So the Lord is saying, know what is good for your body. Okay, because all of us have different types of Lord has did that right for for an end all reason. 
uh, verse 28, for all things are not profitable for all men, neither have every soul pleasure in everything. Be not unsatiable in any dainty thing. That's sweets, right? Nor too greedy upon meat. So although we are able to eat meat, the Lord says, don't be too greedy of it. Uh, verse 30, for excess of meats bringeth sickness. And suffering will turn into choler, which is more sickness, right? So the Lord is letting us know, although we do have the option to eat those meats now, it got to be a balance, but cannot be, can't be unsatiable. With it. Be to our demise, right? Uh, verse 31, by suffering have many perished, that's overeating, but he that taketh heed prolongeth his life. So take heed to that. Although we do have the liberty to eat, now let's go to this. I want to go to Leviticus. Uh, just for the, the new people. Leviticus. Uh, I want to read the last two verses, right? Yeah. Leviticus chapter 11. And let's read verse 40. 6 and 47, right? Um, this is the law of the beast, talking about the beast, and of the fowl, and of every living creature that moveth in the waters. We read that in Genesis. He talked about every living creature is now for meat. And every creature that creepeth upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, and between the beast that God allowed us to read uh, to eat in Genesis 9, that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. So even at that time of the the uh, understanding we could eat meat, and we'll go back to it, it was an understanding that you couldn't eat everything. There was a difference. And we'll read that in a second. Uh, I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, just so you now you understand the clarity of after knowing the law, of what you can and what you can't eat, now you can't be deceived by these crooked-ass Christian uh, pastors, Christianity pastors, that are leading our people astray. Uh, First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 4, and we've all heard it, and we've all used it to justify eating the slop of the earth, the things that were not meant to be eaten after the flood. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll start at verse 1 on down. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So when you, when you find yourself saying, uh, I could just pray over anything, the Lord blessed the food, God made it, that is a seducing spirit, and that's a doctrine of a devil, a deceiver. That's leading you to one bad health and to uh, uh, death and destruction on judgment day. Uh, verse two, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What is that lies in hypocrisy? Some of them lies will be that, um, oh yeah, you can eat whatever you want to eat. I don't eat it myself, but you can eat it if you so choose to. And then they turn around and say, yeah, I don't eat that shit. That stuff's bad for you. <laughs> it kills you in the long run. But you can eat it if you want to. But I don't eat it. That's the speaking lies of hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidden to marry, and commanded to abstain from meats. Paul is uh, prophesying about Catholicism thousands of years ahead of time, right? Um, before it really blew up like it is. Uh, under the Roman, uh, Holy Roman Empire, all this stuff. Forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, like they say with, uh, what's that, ash, right? Went ash Wednesdays. You can eat everything, but uh, you can't eat no meat, but you can eat fish. Fish is a meat. Let me prove that. We will be precepted all day here. <laughs> all praises. Okay, let's go to it. Let's go to it in 1 Corinthians. Make sure you put this precept beside that so you can, you can smash that damn Catholicism, Ash Wednesday stuff. Uh, 
We don't eat meat on Wednesday, only fish. Negro, that's meat. Northern Kingdom, that's meat. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's read verse 38. It says, but God giveth a, it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same. Flesh. Meat. Meat is another word for flesh. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of beast, another of fishes. <laughs> Fish is meat. For the simpletons out there, they don't call it in Catholicism. Flesh of beast, another of fishes, and another of birds. So it's different. Okay, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and let's read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and let's read verse 3. Forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Catholicism. Fish is a meat which God hath created to uh, be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. The truth is the what? The laws of God. You got to know the laws of God to know what to eat, what to receive. Verse 4, for every creature of God is good, perfect for what it was made for, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. See, they never read that verse 5. They, they read that every creature of God is good. <laughs> Nothing to be refused. Give me that pig ass. <laughs> Crazy. Give me that horse. Give me that horse butt. Give me that alligator tail. Give me that catfish on the bottom that just got done eating whatever died. Is that right up there? First Timothy 4, 3, you know, got a plus beside it? Oh, man. Uh, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. That's Leviticus. What can be eaten, what cannot be eaten. Now let's go back to Genesis to prove they knew that. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 9. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, once again. Here we go. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. What are we reading? We are reading the laws of certain laws that the Lord had gave Adam that are still in place. Give me that in uh, let's go to Psalms 119. Show you something in Psalms 119. Psalm 119. This is how you know Noah wasn't a white man. Lord told him, don't eat no food with no blood in there. Noah took heed to it. What it said about Noah, he was a perfect man. Uh, in the eyes. Psalm 119, verse, let's see. Here we go. Verse 160. Psalms 119, 160. It says here, thy word is true from the beginning. From the Bereshith. From Genesis, from the beginning, thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. What's another word for judgments? Brothers, I need you to say that. Give me, give me another word for judgments. Where do judgments come from? Where does God, how does he deem or, or his judgments. Where do they come from? What's another word? Okay. Let's see. 
get that. Uh, while we're waiting on the brothers, going to get a preset. Where is he getting? Okay, laws. I like it. Second Ezra chapter three. Let's go to a precept to prove that Adam had laws, right? Second Ezra chapter three, and uh, let's read verse four on down. Second Ezra chapter three, verse four. O Lord, who bears rule, thou spakest at the beginning. When thou didst plant the earth and that thyself alone and commandest the people and gave us a body unto Adam without soul, which was the workmanship of thy hands, and didst breathe into him the breath of life. The breath of life are the commandments. And he was made living before thee, and thou ledest him into paradise which thy right hand had planted before the uh, earth ever, before ever the earth came forward. And unto him thou gavest commandment to love thy way, which he transgressed, and immediately thou appointest death in him, and in his generations of whom came nations, tribes, people, and kindreds out of number. Now let's see. Here's the proof that here's the proof that um he was he had the commandments that he was teaching them. Verse eight, and every people walked after their own will and did wonderful things before thee and despised thy commandments. Despised thy commandments. Adam had what the laws. He was Lord over all. He was teaching everybody. So we go back to Genesis 9. The Lord is reminding Noah of those laws when it comes to eating that he received. Some things I just can't agree with this, brother. Sorry. Hey, we don't care. Let God be true and every better liar. <laughs> I'm going to sleep good tonight. <laughs> it don't make me no difference. All right, Genesis chapter 9, going back to Genesis chapter 9, and uh, we read verse 4. Uh, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. It's the law pertaining to how we're supposed to eat our food. Uh, verse 5, and surely your blood of your lives will I require it. At the hand of every beast will I require it. What, what is that? That sacrifice. That is animal sacrifice. The Lord's reminding him that of what? Because but remember, this this is this is passed down. Generation, generation. Going back to uh let's go back to it. Genesis chapter four. Let's let's read Genesis chapter three. It's a parable. It's a parable, but um you'll be able to understand it. Lord's will. Understanding it. Because he said, at surely, verse, in verse 5, and surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it. Why is he mentioning beast and blood at the same time right there? Right? Um, Genesis chapter 3, and let's read verse 21 on down. Now, we understand in Genesis 3 what happened. Eve had sinned and caused Adam to sin as well as Death came into the world. The judgment for sin has always been death. Now the Lord, um, he's a, he either have to uh, kill Adam and Eve, right? Or he has to introduce something that stands in place for them, which is what? The blood of the animal. Uh, at, uh, here we go, Genesis 3.21. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? Hey, what are we reading? 
sacrifice in parable. It's going to prove it as we read on. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. We was only supposed to know good. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life, meaning he repents. The tree of life is the commandments. And eat and live forever. Eat means to learn and live forever, right? What causes us to live forever is the laws. Read on. Uh, therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, Jerusalem, to, uh, to till the ground from whence he was taken. He went to Mesopotamia. He went east. Uh, so he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, angels, uh, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Block the understanding is what happened, right? Now, here's a point that we're going to. Uh, to prove about animal sacrifice. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Offerings come from what? sacrifices. Verse 4, and Abel, uh, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance failed. Right. So where's where's Cain and Abel getting that uh, bringing offerings of a lamb and fruits from? Up in Genesis three, when the Lord first gave Ad, uh, Adam sacrifice, um, it's another precept for that too. Let me find it here. Bear with me. We got a little time. We're gonna learn some things on our way. Uh, when it comes to that sacrifice. Show you what. Let me find it. I got. I don't want to say the word. I want to. I want to let the Bible speak. I got the word in my. Know the word. Okay. All right. Go. It's sixteen. About to flip one more page. I'd have found it. We got no sound. No sound, Azaniah. Come on. Everybody's saying no sound. Below that. Well, well don't suppress nothing, man. Leave it alone. Okay, uh, Leviticus 16. And um, let's read verse 8 on down. We're explaining that sacrifice in Genesis 4, Genesis 9, right? Okay, uh, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8. Uh, and Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Scapegoat, stand in place. Look up scapegoat. Pull it up. Let's look what a, a scapegoat is.
There we go. Let's see if we get a definition on it. Scroll down. I can't see it up here. It's zoomed in too much. You got to zoom out. Yeah, zoom out. Zoom out. See what the zoom is. Yeah, zoom to 100%. Okay, scapegoat. A person who is blamed for the wrongdoings, mistakes, or faults of others, especially for reasons of expediency. What's the expediency of the sacrifice of a scapegoat? Is your life is on the line. <laughs> That's the expediency of the scapegoat. That's the point of, a, of the sacrifice. It took the wrongdoings, the mistakes, or faults of others, and it was placed on the, atom, on the, uh, on the animal. That's where when we read back in Genesis 3, Ad, Eve and Ad, Adam and Eve committed the sin. Then we got the skin, the coats of skins that stepped in place. And then Ad, uh, Abel, Cain and Abel, they knew of the same thing. So they bring in offerings. Abel brought what he was supposed to, but he did not. This is all tied back to Genesis 9. So a scapegoat is stands in for the wrongdoings, mistakes, or faults of others. Now, let's go back to Leviticus chapter 16, and we're going to read verse 8 on down again. Drop it, man. Come on. Stay with me. Pay attention back there. Uh, Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 8. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon the uh, which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Where are we at on, on the uh, thing back here, man? Oh. Um, all right. So now let's go back to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. So now we understand why. We got talking about beast. Every beast, well, God says, every beast, I will require it. Zoom out on this. I think this is too close in, man. No, zoom out. Out. Check the, check the thing, man. Okay, that's good. That's good. Zoom out. That's good right there. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, and we are back in verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require it at the hand of every beast will I require it. So sin, sacrifice is still in place, Noah. Uh, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Remember that, is, see, this is, this is one thing, too. You can, you can um, this is for people that are you caught up in Christianity, you don't quite understand. Uh, whenever you say, oh, the law of Moses, nah, brother, this law is way before Moses where it talks about uh, no mercy at the hand of every man's brother. Will I require it, require the life of man? Verse six, whoso sheddeth man blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made he man. That's eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Right? Life for life. That ain't the law of Moses. This is way back before Moses. So, so we just took that bullet right out the chamber of Christianity with that precept right there. You can't say that's the law of Moses. Oh, that's the laws were way before Moses. It just got added on to. Right? Lord introduced it again to us when we came out of Egypt, which we'll get to, Lord's will, down, th down the line. He added things to it, right? And then when Christ came, he took things away from it. But the law still stands. Here's the proof. Matthew. You know what I want? Matthew chapter 5, right? Is that what I want? Verse 17, Christ is even backing up Genesis, backing up Moses, the prophets. Matthew 5, 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law 
or the prophets, anything that the prophets said. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Fulfill what is written of him. People get dumb in Christianity to justify their sin. Oh, he didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law, so I don't have to keep the law. That don't make no damn sense. Christ wasn't no schizophrenic. He wasn't crazy like half the black folk is. He didn't have a white man uh, uh, set up in his mind. A white man's satellite. Verse 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. What does that mean? That means the judgment for the penalty of thou shalt not kill, the, the judgment for it has never gone nowhere. You just got some grace and mercy to get it right. But if you never repent from that sin, you will have to answer for it on judgment day. And that, that judgment for that of killing someone else is death. Just this time is going to be eternal when you stand before Christ. The laws are never done away with. Right? Going back to Genesis now. Genesis chapter 9. Let me move on. I'm 40 minutes on six verses. Lord, help me. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 7. And you be, and you, and you be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. Multiply what? Righteous kids. Right? Right? That's what we want. Righteous kids. Was talking to Noah. Um, verse 9. And I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle and every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And uh, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. So that's that's one of them. That's the covenant. And, you know, I was thinking about this. You know, these nations don't have. They don't have too many covenants with God. They, they've got the general covenant with God, like. Um, okay, I won't flood the earth no more, general. Um, animals should be afraid of you. That's a general. Um, thou shalt die the death. That's upon all flesh. But they don't have no good covenants with God. They don't have one with God at all. He didn't make a covenant with the other nations at all. The only reason they flying up under the banner of not getting flooded out is because God don't want to kill us with a flood no more. I ain't going to the priest. You learn it. That's it. Um, it's in it's in Jeremiah thirty one. You want to read? Uh, Genesis chapter nine verse twelve. And God said, "This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth." Let's go to Sirach chapter 43. Let's read about that bow in the cloud. Genesis chapter, I mean, uh, Sirach chapter 43. Uh, let's read verse 11. Yeah. 12. Let's see what bow God is talking about. Uh, Sirach 43 and 11. Look upon the rainbow. The rainbow. And praise him that made it. Very beautiful it is in the brightness thereof. It compasseth the heaven about with a glorious circle. I'm trying to wrap my mind around. I still can't do it. Why it looks like it does to us and not the circle to God. But if you over top of it, you can see that it's a circle. You over top of it, you can see that it's a circle. It's amazing. Most high is next level. Uh, Moving on here, uh, verse 12, it can, uh, let's see, verse 12, it can pass the heaven about with a glorious circle, and the hands of the Most High have bended it. That's dope. Uh, look up rainbow right now. Let's see what pop up. Pull up rainbow. Let's just see what pops up.
Oh, what was that on the other side of the screen? Okay. No, that's fine. That's fine right there. Um, but looking at this, automatically the world has turned the rainbow of God, the covenant he made with all flesh that he won't drown us out with a flood. They have turned it in to the sodomites. Look at that. Oh. Hey, hey, you know what that means, though? You know what that means? The spiritual eyes will see this, though. Go, go back to me. You know what spiritual eyes will see that. You know what them, them doing this? Go back to the class, man. Go back to the class. And, and X that stuff out, yeah. Um, you know what this is really letting us know? America is Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's go to it. Revelation. Spiritual eyes is going to see this, though. Why would they take the rainbow and use it as their symbol here in Babylon the Great? Why? They could have used anything else. They could have made up some colors. But they chose the rainbow of God to express their sodomy, their homosexuality. Spiritual eyes is going to see this. Revelation chapter 11. Let's read verse 8. And their dead bodies, dead because of sin, that's what makes us dead, shall lie in the street of the great city. That great city is what? America, Babylon the Great, which spiritually is called Sodom. And Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. His image, his teachings was crucified here. But the Lord is telling you, this ain't physical Sodom, it's spiritual Sodom. And they, and, and they left the clue. They're going to take my bow and use it as their symbol for sodomy. The Bible's a true book. You better start putting all your faith and hope and trust in it. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, and let's read verse 13 again. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth, and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. What's going to destroy all flesh now? You know what I want. Let's go to 2 Peter. There's so many people. I'm gonna get, I got to get straight to it. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, and let's read verse, uh, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. Peter was an Israelite. I want you to know that all you, uh, what's that? Racial reconciliation people out there. Peter was an Israelite, all right, a Hebrew, a Jew, uh, but is long-suffering to us word, not everybody, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The only people that can repent are the Israelites. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat, that great noise, bombs. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's how the Lord is going to be destroying this place the second time around. And there's many precepts on that. We'll be all day on that. It'll be another class, all right? But let's go back to Genesis chapter 9, and let's read verse 17. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Right? Uh, and the sons of Noah that went for, forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Now pull up the map of Shem, Ham, and Japheth to see what lands they went forth into. 
pull it up real quick so everybody can know. Yeah, there we go, Matt. Second one. There we go. Click on it. Well, let's click on the um the third one. Yeah. New tab. Here we go. All right. So you see, it says Shem, Ham, and Japheth went forth out of the uh, ark, right? So you see where Ham dwelt, which is Africa. Now on this map, they have separated Israel from being Africa. Israel is a part of Africa, and it's going to prove that the further we read in these chapters. Uh, but you see, Shem, they dwelt in what is mainly known as like uh, Saudi Arabia, that area, and all of that landmass. Then you got Japheth. Japheth went all over all that Europe, right? Go back. Let's go back to the uh, map things, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and click on that second one. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So on that one, they changed it. So can you zoom out on it? There we go. Okay. So you see, and this uh, it's, that has the names of them. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But you see where they went forth out of the boat. Okay. Let's go back to the scripts here. Um, verse 18. And the sons of Noah... Uh, that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Now look at this. Ham is the father of Canaan. Hamites. And we know Canaan was where? The, uh, the land of Israel. It was originally called the land of Israel. That's how we know that Israel is also Africa. But on maps, they try to separate it to make you not think. When you say Israel, you think of a different uh, nationality, a different place. You say Middle East in your mind instead of saying Africa. Because if you, if, if you understood that Israel was a part of Africa, that was common knowledge. If it was common knowledge that Israel was a part of Africa, whenever you, say, whenever you say I'm from Israel, they would automatically associate it with black people. And people, we would tell, you know, we ain't stupid. We would connect the dots. But it's done that way for a reason. So it can be revealed through the mouth of the prophets, through the scriptures in the last days. The Lord got a perfect plan for us to win. It shall come to pass. All right, verse uh, 19. These are the three sons of Noah, and then was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be in husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Right? Now, let's see. Get a precept. Uh, remember, Joe, uh, Noah was perfect. Let's, let, me, let me show you. Some. Let's, let's read some things about Noah real quick so we don't get the wrong idea. What I want. Let's go back to, no, nope, we're going back to uh, Peter. I want to talk about Noah first, right? Uh, here we go. Second Peter, Second Peter, chapter uh, two and verse five. Let's read about Noah real quick. Second Peter, chapter two, verse five. And spared. Uh, what is Peter talking about? Peter's talking about the flood. Okay, talking about the flood. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. So Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Remember, God only deals with righteous people, commandment keepers. Right? So Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Let's go to um, Sirach. Let's go to Sirach chapter 44. Sirach chapter 44, verse 1. We're learning some things about Noah real quick. Um, Sirach chapter 44, verse 1. Let us now praise famous man and our fathers that begat us. Noah was a famous man. That's why he's written of the book of God. Jump over to verse 17. Noah was found perfect and righteous. Noah was found perfect and righteous. In the time of wrath, he was taken in exchange for the world. Therefore was... Uh, he left as a remnant unto the earth when the flood came. Okay, 
and an everlasting covenant was made with him that all flesh should perish no more by the flood. Noah was perfect and righteous and famous. Okay, so let's understand what was what was the reason for him getting to that point of being. See, the Lord ain't like um, the Lord ain't like a uh, uh, man. He ain't like uh, Esau and them come to where you know you get one one slip and then they deem you that way forever. Let's see what it says. Proverbs 24, 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. So although you may make a mistake, you should still be righteous in the eyes of the Lord through the commandments of God. But let's see. What, what are we reading about with Noah and the and drinking, right? Uh, let's go to Proverbs chapter 31. And let's read verse 6 and 7. Let's see. What was the drinking coming from, right? Uh, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. We got to put our minds, our, our, our mind, try to be in the mindset of Noah. Remember, Noah just preached for a hundred years. Repent, repent. Destruction is coming. Repent from your sins. Turn to the Lord. Turn back to the Most High God. He's preaching this for a hundred years. Understand, he got relationships with people around there. Our people was there. Our people got, got drowned out because they was wicked. Noah had friends. No head acquaintances, right? Over the 500 years of his life that he had been living. So he just seen all of them drown. And when you read, when you read, um, when you read about the flood when it came, the angel forced Noah onto that boat and shut the, the door behind him. It says, put the door to shut. Because Noah was out here doing this. Repent. Repent. It's, it's that. The angel's like, let's go. And, and then shut the door behind him. Go back and read it. Slow down and read it and, and, and read those fine details of it. Um, but it says, give it un, and wine unto those that be of a heavy heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. So this is what we see with Noah. This is straight out the flood, man. Everybody he known is gone. <laughs> so he drunk a little bit too much, but he's still, still righteous in the eyes of God. Forget that. That's our forefather. Right? Um, let's go back to it. Genesis chapter 9, and let's read verse 20. And Noah began to be in husbandman a farmer, right? And he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, Hamites, uh, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Read, read Leviticus, right? Chapter 18. It goes into that na nakedness. What are we seeing here? More commandments being applied. They, they didn't want to see the, fa the nakedness of their father. Ham, he didn't give a damn. Verse 24, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger, younger son had done unto him. How did he know that if he was asleep and Noah, I mean, and Ham took a peep at his nakedness? How would he know that? Let's go to the book of Job. Uh, let's go to the book of Job. Get some precepts for that. Job chapter 33, verse 14. Let's show you that. Why? Because some, some people might have that question, right? Heard of it before. Job 33, verse 14. 
For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon man, and slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of man and sealeth their instructions. So the Lord told him who looked to him. Here's another precept, too. Uh, go to the book of Amos. It just hit me. You know what I want. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Because remember, Noah was a what? What did it say in the book of Peter? Let's see who's paying attention. What did it say in the book of Peter about Noah? What type of person was he? What was he doing? What was it? Let's see who's paying attention. I'll wait on y'all. I want to see it on the screen. What type of man was Noah? It talked about it in Peter. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Let's see. Preacher, this thing. Preacher. Uh, sisters, please refrain from answering the questions. Be silent. We have a church right now. Sisters, I'm not asking you the questions. Your job is just to listen. This is church. It's just online streaming church keep the commandments not permitted to speak i need all you sisters to type understood i'll wait on that All right. We got one understood. Sisters, Sisters check your spirit, man. All right. Um, move it on here. Okay. Um, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. You correct, brothers. Y'all correct. Uh, Amos 3 and 7. It says, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The Lord told Noah in his sleep what Ham did. Going back to Genesis now. Genesis chapter 9, and let's read verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. The Lord, I mean, now what did the Lord reveal also to him in this, in his vision, in his sleep? He revealed to him that God will send the Messiah and the righteous seed through Shem. That God would only be dealing with Shem. He wouldn't deal with Ham. He wouldn't deal with Japheth. He, I'm only going to be dealing with Shem. He revealed that to him. Right? Um, read that. Read that in. Uh, let, no, we ain't reading it, but look at it. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew his younger brother had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of service shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. 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 Right? Guaranteed Jefferson? No, that's wrong. 
Uh, stop putting precepts up and pay attention. Move it on here. And it says, verse 26, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth. He shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. 950 years. Move it on. Now, uh, Genesis chapter 10. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, to them were sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Die. Pull back up the um pull back up the the map so we can see where Gog and Magog and Madai and Javon and Tubal and Meshach and Tyrus Taras. Yep. Uh let's see if we can zoom in on it. I'll be dealing with the sons of Japheth, right? So zoom in. Okay. There we go. Okay, that's good. Okay, so you see. You see the name Tyrus. You see Meshach there. You see, uh, where else? Gomar, Ashkenaz, right? Let's read it in the scripts now. Verse 3, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz. Now, Ashkenaz is just a Hebrew word for Germany. Okay, so that's up in Europe that we're looking at right here, right? It's Europe for today. Um. Rephath and Togomar, and the sons of Javan. You see Javan on the list too, right over there, right? Javan there. Um, and Elisha, 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 and Tarshish, right? Tarshish um, is what we know as Spain. If we can back out, let's let's see. Give me another map. Let's type in Spain. Yep, give me images. Uh, nah, let's just type in map and let's see what pop up. Let's see if we can see where it is. Nah, back back out, back out, uh, cause I want a more a general bigger map. Just type in Spain. Okay, that's good right there. Click a second one. That's good. Okay, so we see where Spain is, right? That is what we know of Tarshish. Then we got Kittim. Kittim is Rome. That's the little, the boot right there. Uh, you got to go back to the map. There we go. But you go back to the regular map because the green thing is, is blocking it. Like the little boot. Go, go, back, go back to the Spain map. No, no, not that one. Google here. Type in um, Rome. Rome map. Blurry. Give me a clear one. There we go. Oh, okay. Oh, I like it. I got the ancient names on it. I like that one. Okay. Let's keep it. Go, go over some to your your yeah. Another way, other way, right there. There we go. Okay, so we see Kidum. See Rome. It's Rome right there. Kidum and Rome. It's not on that one, but that's what Kidum is. It's Rome. Now go to the other map that we just had where they went. You can see. There we go. So you see Kidum right there. Yep. There's Rome. There we go. The same areas. Okay. Um, Javan would be Greece, too, for those that wanted to know. And uh, Dodanium, verse 5 now, back in Genesis chapter 10, verse 5. You can drop that. Uh, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Uh, verse 6, and the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Foot, and Canaan. Cush, Ethiopia. Right, let's look it up. Cush, type in Ethiopia, Cush, or Cush. Let's pull it up. Type in Cush. 
Uh, just type in Kush. Let's see what, what they give us for. Kush, not Jush. Hell. <laughs> Check your spirit, man. The old man popped up on you. <laughs> Images. Oh, Lord. It's spelled K, it's spelled C U A, a C U S H, man. Lord. <laughs> Look at how wicked this world is, man. Type in Ethiopia. Type in Ethiopia. There we go. Okay. The third one to the right. A fourth one, fourth one. There we go. We pull up, type in Kush, they sell nothing but weed plants. Okay, so we see uh, Ham, where Kush is Ethiopia. Mizraim is Egypt. That's, that's constrict, right? Foot, which is, so put, is North Libya. That is to the left of Egypt. Okay, it's to the left of Egypt. The country to the left of Egypt. And Canaan. Canaan is where you see Jerusalem. The map right there. Okay? So to let you know that Israel is Africa because, go back to the overall map, that, yep, Ham, Ham inhabited what is known as Africa. And Canaan was in the land of Canaan, which is Jerusalem, Africa. Okay, let's go back to the scripts here. Uh, verse 6, and the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Foot, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, and Saptah, and Rehomah, and Saptachah, and the sons of Rehomah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalne in the land of Shinar. Type in Shinar so people can see where Shinar is. Shinar. Nope, that's Shimar. Shinar. In, yeah, there you go. N A R. N A R. We go. Uh, the fourth one to the far right. Yeah, the fifth one. Fifth one. Five one. Yep. Blow it up. Let's show it to him. And I'm going to read it again. It says here in verse 10 And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalne, in the land of Shinar. Shinar is what we know as Iraq. That is Iraq. And out of that land went forth Ashur, which are the Assyrians, and built it Nineveh, and the city Rohoboth, and Kalah. So let's go to it. Let's go to um, right there. Uh, is that it? Is that ancient or is that modern? No, no. Go down, go down, go down. Right there, Babylon. No, no, the ancient Sumer. To the right, yeah, right there. Yep. Show the people. So what we looking at here? All of these places up here, Eridu, Lagash, Erech, Nineveh, Cod, the land of Shinar. See these things. The reason why a lot of the Bible is a uh, fairy tale to Negroes here on this side of the world is because <laughs> all of our history is still over there on the other side of the earth. We're, li we're re literally reading about a book that his origins were on the eastern side of the world, but we're over here in the western side with none of these things visually to see. But We'll see him again. I think just right there. All right, hey, let's do let, let's uh tap Nimrod real quick. Let's go to Nimrod real quick. Uh, the images that I I gave to you in uh the Telegram. Nope, the images that I gave to you in the Telegram. We're gonna discuss Nimrod here real quick. Uh, then we'll we'll get to 
because we're going to go through chapter 10 quickly. Yep, that's the book. Uh, can they see that? Yeah. We to see. Yeah, they don't care about that book, man. That, that book, you know, most people ain't going to buy it because of the title. <laughs> now, it, got, it do got some bones in it. Can they see the book? Okay, now the book does got some bones in it. You know, the breakdowns of biblical understanding, the the uh, prophecies and things of that nature, it don't quite have together. But the historical context of it, it does. Let's go to the next picture. Uh, I'm going to read this for you here real quick. Now, a lot of this was taken out of the two Babylons. This is basically a cheaper version of the two Babylons. Okay. Uh, it says, Alexander Hislop, a Bible scholar, spent painstaking years compiling data from inscriptions found by Layard in a library full of the works from a multitude of ancient pagan scribes and scholars of mythology. Like a jigsaw puzzle, Hislop gathered pieces of historical data and placed the material in their proper time slots. History says Ninus, the first king of Nineveh, was Nimrod, the great-grandson of Noah. The name Nineveh means the habitation of Ninus. The name Nineveh means the habitation of Ninus, which was Nimrod. And the scriptures say it was, uh, it was Nimrod who built Nineveh. Uh, the first king of Nineveh was the first mortal to be deified at his death and was the actual father of the gods. This pagan belief of kings be, uh, being deified at their death was adopted from Mesopotamia to Egypt. You know, these Egyptians do that. Those pharaohs were considered gods on earth. To the North and South Americas, one such god who has been traced to Nimrod, the origin, original deified god, was the pagan ill-omened black god of Anglo-Saxons. His name was Zernobogus. This man headed bull god name this man headed bull god name is almost pure chaldee and his name uh means the seed of the prophet cush um in the bible it says cush begat nimrod hence the beginning of the part man and part animal symbols of gods that have guarded the place of kings and pharaohs all over the world the assyrian hercules who has been traced to nimrod also began to be a mighty one in the earth. Um, without club, spear, or weapons of any kind, attack the bull, having overcome it. He sets the bull's horns on his head as a trophy of victory and a symbol of power. The Vikings, the Anglo-Saxons, the Africans, and even the American Indians wore horned headdresses to display their might and power. The bull or calf became a symbol of divinity as in Exodus 32. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so right here, reading about Nimrod, right? Uh, to the first inhabitants of the world after the flood, Nimrod, Ninus, the first king of Babel, his queen, Semiramis, and their uh, miraculously born god, child, Tazmu, the son of the sun, was the first pagan trinity. So this, now you see where that whole Trinity doctrine comes from, from Catholicism. It goes all the way back to Nimrod. Was the first pagan trinity. A multitude of various names have covered their true identity, but the discoveries of the ancient ruins of Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, Mexico, etc., have enabled scholars to trace their worship from Babylon and Assyria to the Hindus, and across the ocean to the early American Indians, their pattern of worship is usually the same. Only the names are different because of the various languages in the world. Comparing Bible doctrine with pagan mythology, scholars both Christian and non-Christian will agree that some of the most cherished traditions and ordinances kept by both Catholic and Protestant Christian churches Christianity, Baptist, Jehovah Witness, whatever it want to be, have their origin from sun worship and not from the Old, Te 
Old and New Testaments. That's why you go to church on Sunday. You worship in Nimrod. You better come up out of that stuff. Our people got to come up out of that. Uh, so it says here, Sunday sacredness, Christmas, the Christmas tree, Easter, the Easter egg and the bunny, hot cross buns and Good Friday are not holy days and ordinances to be kept sacred from the Bible, but were sacred to the ancient Babylonian gods, Nimrod, Baal, Semiramis, Semiramis, Semiramis is what they got right there. Semiramis, Semiramis. Ashtaroth was another name. Okay, I'm going to jump down to the last paragraph to show you where this a whole trinity stuff come from. Now, he, the philosophy, says when uh, Semiramis died, her spirit, like her husband Ninus, Nimrod, became immortal and flew up to the moon and took possession of it. She became the moon goddess, the mother of gods, the queen of heaven. When her god child Tammuz died, the pagans claimed his spirit became immortal and took possession of the east star, Venus, and appears together with the sun and moon in the spring. This was also known as the New Year Festival. This is why you got to keep the commandments of God, because if you don't know the Bible and its precept upon precept, they will straight mix paganism with ancient paganism. And you will be caught up thinking that you are in the truth, that you worshiping God in a Christian church, worshiping Nimrod. Go, go to the next one. There's one more picture here. Right. So I wanted to go over this just to show you here are just a few names that identify with the original pagan trio of Nimrod. Semiramis and Tammuz. Nimrod, the Lord of heaven, Israel called him Baal. Phoenicians, El, Babylon, Belis, Assyria, Ninus, Greece, Zeus, Rome, Jupiter, Egypt, Ra. Look at this. Vishnu, Panku, Teotelan, whatever you hell it say that. Teotelan, Teotelan. Scandinavia, that's them, uh, that's that Thor. Scandinavia is that Thor and, and all of that stuff. They called it Odin. Nimrod, from the beginning, when he deified himself as God, the names have just changed throughout time because they don't have a God. And the whole theory behind it, now Tammuz, the pagan messiah. Israelites call him Tammuz. Phoenicians call him Bacchus. Babylon called him Tammuz. Assyria, Hercules. You can go back and, and look at the video and see all these names. For the Semiramis, the queen of heaven, Ashtaroth, Astarte, Ishtar, Beltis, Aphrodite. For all you wonder, Aphrodisiac, you little whoremongers out there. Sibeli from Rome, Diana, Egypt, they call her Isis and Hathor. Because remember, Nimrod is way before all of Egypt and also this is in the beginning. Okay, let's drop all of that. Let's go back to the scriptures. Okay, so let's go back to the scripts here. All right, so uh, we pick it up in Genesis chapter 10, and we are going to read verse 12. And resin between Nineveh and Calah, the same as the great city, and Mizraim begat Ludim and Anamim and Lahabim and Naphtahim and Pathrasim and Kathlasim. Kath Caslahim, and out of him, out of whom came Philistim and Caphtarim, and Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. Write this beside verse 15. Heth equals Tyree. Go to the pre, you'll get the precept later. Heth equals Tyree. Verse 16. And the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Zimmerite, and the Hamathite, and afterward, uh, where the families of the Canaan, uh, Canaanites spread abroad, and the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to uh, Gerar. 
and unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam and unto Lasha. Lasha, have you want to say it? So also with Sodom and Gomorrah, there were five cities destroyed also with that. Sodom and Gomorrah were just the main ones, but Adma and Zeboam, even unto Lasha, goes into that. And you read about that again also in Deuteronomy. It names four of the cities instead of the five. Well, it's a little, you can study Deuteronomy, see where it names the four cities, and then come back and precept it with this, okay? Uh, verse 20, these are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues in their countries and in their nations. Unto Shem also the father of all the children of Eber. That's where the name Hebrew comes from. Eber, Hebrew, Hebrew. It comes from that, okay? Uh, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even unto him were children born. A, uh, do we have a um, Zondervan Bible dictionary about Ham? Uh, go on Google. You might be able to find it on Google. Type in Zondervan Ham. If you can't find it there, let me know. Before we move on for Ham, I'll show you this. Right, we go over it all the time. Oh, there we go. Okay, let's read it for the people here. So in the Zondervan Bible Dictionary, just before we move off of Ham, which are Hamites, which are the the original, uh, uh, well, not the original, but the, the people that populate Africa, uh, that we are scattered among in Africa, because our people are scattered amongst Ham in Africa. Okay, they're scattered amongst them in Africa. Our people are in Africa still all over. You've seen many classes on that from Bishop, okay? So don't get it confused. But we are not Hamites. We are Shemites, according to the Bible. So it says here, Ham, the youngest son of Noah. So Japheth, the oldest, Shem, second, Ham's the youngest. Born probably be about 96 years before the flood and one of eight persons to live through the flood. He became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. So we are not Hamitic, we are Shemitic. Let's go back to the scripts here. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, and we're going to read verse 21. Pull me back up. Um, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, which is Hebrew, uh, the brother of Japheth, and the elder, uh, the elder, even unto him were children born, the children of Shem, Elam, which are East Indians, Ashur, which is Assyria, Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram, Aram is Syrians, and the children of Aram, Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash, and Arphaxad begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. His brother's name was Joktan, and Joktan begat Almodad, and Sheleph, and Hazar Maveth, and Jerah, and Hadaram, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Obal, and Abimael, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab, all these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Misha, as thou goest unto Sefer, a mount of the east. These are the sons of Shem, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, and after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So you read Genesis 10 and lets you know that God never wanted people to be all intermingled, all of that stuff. No, that is against God. Stay to yourself. You got your ways. My people got their ways. But in Babylon the Great, 
They do what Nimrod did. Let's read it. Genesis chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. Now, look at this. Uh, they journeyed from the east. Pull back up the, the map, right? Pull up the map again to show well, how they land in Shinar. Okay? Uh, so you see circle Shinar where Elam is and the Tigris River and Babylon. You, you don't know where Babylon is, man? There you go. All right. So you see all of that. Shinar, Babylon, Erek, coming from the east, east of that, or west of Tigris, would have been what? Jerusalem. So from leaving from Jerusalem, you end up in Shinar, as it says here in verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, right? And they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone. Drop the, the image, man. What's going on? Pay attention, man. Okay, here we go. Uh, and they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they one for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Where are they getting that from? The flood. They are getting that from the flood. Okay? They ain't trying to be caught up like they once were. Uh, and they said, verse 4, and they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be, be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man built it. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. This they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Was they going to imagine to do righteousness? It would be pure evil. That's what he said. They got to break them up because evil will be even higher than it is. <laughs> got to break them up. Go to, verse 7, go to, let us go down. And they confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build the city. There has never been equality in the Bible. There is no let's hold hands. That is completely against God. Uh, where's the precept? Let me show something. Let's go to Deuteronomy real quick. 32, right? It says that in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Uh, D-E-U-T-E-R-O. N-O-M-Y. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. Let's show you this. It says, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, Divided, separated. The sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. That's now, as we think about this, go to um, Thessalonians. Look at this. Oh, man, we're going to tie this up. This is all coming... Coming on together. Here we go. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
Check this, man. Second Thessalonians chapter two. I'll put these together, but this is gonna let you know who who is man of sin today. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter two, and we're gonna read verse three. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. Look at this. This is how you know he's the man of sin. Check this out. Fuck him. Fuck that dude. Get no my nerve. Get no other people's nerve. There we go. We appreciate you. Goodbye. All right, here we go. Uh, going back to it. It says, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and now in verse 4. Look at this. It says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. How does, how does this man today oppose God? God, we read in Genesis chapter 11, he said, I, I, I'm separating all of these people. I don't want them to be one. I'm I'm separating the sons of Adam. Getting them away from my children. I don't want them near. But what does Esau say? Nope. All be one people. One nation under God. That's what they say. What they say? Indivisible and liberty and justice for all. I think it's how it used to go. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, who opposes, the man of sin opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Man, telling you, this Bible is a true book. Let's go back to it. Genesis chapter 11. Nimrod wanted all nations to be one people and come together. God said, no, separate them based off my children. Genesis chapter 11, verse 8. So the Lord scattered abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from this did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Go back to that map. Go back to that map. No, no, no. Yep. So what did, what did, what did Nimrod do? Just like this man of sin today who shows himself as God, just like Nimrod did in the beginning where he made himself a God, he deified himself. The same thing this white man is doing today, deifying himself, painting Jesus to look like him. God looked like him. The angels look like him. He's deifying himself all over again and heaping all nations unto himself, just like Nimrod did back in the land of Shinar. In Babylon the Great. Damn, the Bible's a true book. Man, that's cool. I never even thought about it like that. All praises for these four chapters a day. So the Lord said he tried to gather all people to him in Babylon, in Shinar. Everybody come here. The Lord confounded the languages and sent them back to the places of where they originally are supposed to be. Ham went back where he's supposed to be. Shem went back where he's supposed to be. Japheth went back where he was supposed to be. Man, the Lord has declared the end from the beginning. All right, you can drop that. You can bring me back. That's, that's, man, it's the man, he is, this white man is the man of sin. You just got to open your spiritual eyes and see it. And separate from him like God wanted us to.
Separate what? Spiritually. Mentally. Let go of his ways. Return to your heritage, your ways, your customs, your feast days, your laws, your God. Leave his politics, his Christmas, his Trinity worshiping. Leave that stuff alone. That's the stuff they did with Nimrod and Tammuz and Semiramis. It's the man of sin all over again. Okay, we move it on. Genesis chapter 11 and uh, verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxai two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxai 500 years. And he begat, uh, where are we at? Uh, so, uh, and Arphaxai lived 500, 5 and 30 years uh, and begat Selah. And Arphaxai uh, lived after he begat Selah 403 years and begat sons and daughters. Now, I want you to understand this. Remember, the earth is being populated now. These is hundreds of years are passing each, each person that we read. And so they having kids and kids and kids and kids and kids, all right? Uh, and uh, where we at? Verse 14, and Salah lived 30 years and begat Eber. And Salah lived after he begat Eber 403 years and begat sons and daughters. 403 years of having kids. Okay, and Eber, verse 16, and Eber lived uh, four and 30 years and begat Peleg. And Eber lived after he begat Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Reu. And Peleg lived after he begat Reu uh, 209 years and begat sons and daughters. And Reu lived two and thirty years and begat Serug. And Reu lived after he begat Serug two hundred and seven years. Y'all notice something about the, the lifespans here? Notice the lifespans. Seven years and begat sons and daughters. And Serug lived thirty years and begat Nahor. And Serug lived after he begat Nahor two hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah and hundred and nineteen years, begat sons and daughters. Terah lived seventy years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Okay? Uh, verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram and Nahor, Haran, and Haran begat Lot. Okay, real quick, let's I want to. Before we move on, a little bit of something about Lot. A little bit about Lot, right? What does it say about Lot? Go back to Peter here. Right? Second Peter chapter 2, and let's read verse 7. Read a little bit about Lot here. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 7. And delivered just Lot, what does it say? What does it mean to be just? What does it mean to be just? Ezekiel 18 and 4. Let's show you what it means to be just so we can find out what type of man Lot was. Ezekiel chapter 18. Let's read verse 4. It says, But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, so to be just means that you're a lawful commandment keeping person. Going back to Second Peter now. Second Peter chapter two verse nine. The Lord knoweth how to deliver. Oh, Second Peter chapter two verse seven. And delivered just lot, commandment keeping lot. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man, Lot was a righteous man. Uh, dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Let me see if it says anything. Okay. All right. So let's go back to Genesis. He was. Genesis chapter 11, and we in verse 27. 
Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity. Ur of the Chaldeans. Ur is, uh, it means fire. If you look up the etymology of it, it means fire. Ur. That's where fire comes from. Ur of the Chaldees. Of the Chaldees. That's Babylon. So, let you know, Abraham was born in this area, okay? Verse 29, and Abram and the whore took them wives. The same of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of the whore's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child, and Terah took Abram his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of, Chal of the Chaldees to the land of Canaan. They came in Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So let's read Genesis chapter 12. Go on some precepts here. Okay. Uh, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, will bless thee and make thy name great. Thou shall be a blessing. I'm going to deal with that verse 1. Give me uh, Isaiah chapter 51, verse 2. It said, Abram, get thee out from thy kindred. This is for some of y'all that might be holding on, afraid to repent because of what family may say or what friends may say or whatever. Take a, um, a note out of thy forefather Abraham's book. Genesis, I mean, Isaiah chapter 51, and let's read verse 2. It says, look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah that bear you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. The same thing with many of us. The Lord, for some of us, we're the only one that's been called out of our family. You understand the truth. You know the Lord is calling you to come repent. Get yourself into a congregation so you can learn these laws and, and make yourself perfect for the second coming. But you allow your kindred to hold you back. That should not be. I'll read it again, Isaiah 51 and 2. Look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. So a lot of you all are holding back yourself from being blessed and increased in the spirit because your kindred is holding you back. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12 and 1. And now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Give me that in uh, Matthew. Let's go to Matthew and see what uh, Christ said about that. He spoke on something like that. Right? Let's see what Christ says about that. <laughs> Word on one. Here we go. Matthew chapter 10. Let's read verse 34. We're going to read 34 on down. So we're going to start at verse 32. Verse 32. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before man, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before man, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Now, I'll let you know, it means something. 
it means something to uh to Christ. Yet yeah, right now, uh, let's show you that it means something. You confessing him. He's a black man. He's the son of God. He's the savior of Israel. That stuff you confessing, it means something to Christ. I'm going to show you this. Go to Matthew chapter 16, and uh, let's read verse 13 through 15. Watch Christ ask the closest people to him at the time. Let's see what he says. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do man say that I, the son of man, am? The Lord had his ear to the ground, to the streets. What people out there saying about me? I want to know, because y'all out there doing the work, what do they think? Verse 14, and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some, Elias, which is Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, which is Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. Verse 15, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? He asked them, confess, who, who am I, though, to you? I know what everybody else is saying. I know what, you know, people say, I'm a, I'm a Beelzebub, and I ain't the son of God, and I'm a, I'm a, I am cast out demons by the help of the devil. But who do you say that I am? Y'all, you, you, you call, I called you. I called all 12 of y'all, just like he called Abraham, just like he called each and every one of us, who do you say that I am? How do you confess me to people? Verse 16, and Simon Peter answered, said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. It means something when you confess. We're going back to Matthew now. It means something when you confess. He's the son of God. Son of God is black. God is black. He came to save the Israelites, the blacks, Hispanics, and Native Indians. He didn't come to save anybody else. I confess that truth before all. For what reason? Verse 32, Matthew 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before man, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before man, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Divide. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy worthy of me. Yeah, I've been looking. Here. All right. Um, so, the Lord, when he called you to, to leave your kindred, don't let him hold you back. You got to go. You got to come in and repent so the Lord could do this. Go back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Not talking about everybody. Let's get it. Acts chapter 3, verse 25. We almost finished, y'all. We only got a few minutes left. But let's see, because that's a, that's a Christianity, uh, uh, what you want to say? Uh, uh, stumbling block right there. Oh, he's going to bless you to bless. They use that for everybody. It's not talking about everybody. Nope, 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 not at all. Genesis, uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 25. Here's the proof of it. Ye are the children of the prophets. Who is that talking about? The Israelites. Here's the precept. Let's go to Amos chapter 2, verse 11. The book of Amos. Chapter 2, verse 11. Ye are the children of the prophets. Amos chapter 2, verse 11. And I raised up of your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith 
the Lord. Going back to Acts now. Ye children of, ye are the children of the prophets. Who is speaking here? Who is he speaking to? The Israelites. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy, in thy, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Why would it have to say the kindreds of the earth be blessed? Where would Israel be scattered into all nations of the earth? Uh, let's go, let's go, let's read verse 26 also. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. We read about, I ain't got time, but we read about that also in Galatians, okay? For you Galatians 3 uh, Bible thumpers, that gets destroyed also in that too, right? Uh, and you also read about it in Tobit. But let's go back to Genesis. That's a quick precept for you. Here we go. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Why? Because through Abraham, what was going to be able to happen? Israel would have a chance to come back. Whether they were in, in uh, sin or not, they would have a chance to repent. Whether they were circumcised or not, they would have a chance to repent. And Paul goes into those letters, Romans chapter 4. You can read it. We'll read it one day. Uh, verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he had departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered in his, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. They went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Canaan is where? Africa. Northeast Africa. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, which is Shechem, unto the plain of Marie, uh, Marae. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, un, and said unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. He removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, the Egyptians shall see thee. They shall say, This his wife, this is his wife, and they will kill me. They will save thee alive. Now, uh, don't get misunderstood. Remember, Back in verse 4, it said Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed. So, so Sarah is around the same age as, um, as Abraham. They was only 10 years apart. So she in her 60s or something, looking cold-blooded. That's our fourth, fourth mother right there. Because Israel has the best-looking women on the face of the earth. Best looking man, too, because we come thy God. Say I, verse 13, say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with uh, me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair. Princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and he entered. He entreated Abram uh, well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen, and he asses, and manservants, and maidservants, and she asses, and camels. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife, Abram. 
said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? For I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. Pharaoh commanded his man concerning him. They sent him away. Wife, all that he had. All right. So that has been IUIC Scripts 365. Genesis 9 through 12 uh, for this day. Tomorrow we'll be back again. Lord's will, life last. We'll be doing 13 through 17. 13 through 16. Okay, so stay tuned. Same time, same place. If you got questions pertaining to what we went over today, uh, just write them. Uh, Message us on IUIC classrooms, and we'll get to those in uh, first come, first uh, first come, first serve, decently and in order. Okay. Uh, so with that, I've been Captain Zakar. Lord's will, life lasts. I'll see you next Wednesday. Good night.